George Blake was outwardly the embodiment of the quintessential British gentleman. Charismatic, intelligent and radiating charm, he was, to MI6, the very model of an intelligence officer. However, beneath his polished exterior was a man who felt that he never did quite belong. Having become enthralled with the promise of a communist utopia, and disillusioned by NATO military tactics during the Korean War, Blake turned his back on his country, betraying national secrets and fellow agents to the Soviets during the 1950s era of the Cold War. Unlike many of those whom he betrayed, Blake went on to live a long life behind the Iron Curtain in Moscow, courtesy of the Kremlin. With decades to ponder his life's choices, he said that he harbored no regrets. To the very end, he remained content with his decisions, his conscience unburdened. He believed that in the world of espionage, no one is truly innocent. Born on the 11th of November 1922 in Rotterdam, George's birthplace was a melting pot of cultures and ideas, perhaps foreshadowing his complex beliefs and ideals. His family name was originally Bahar, with his Egyptian father Elbert being of Jewish descent. George grew up enjoying the tales told by his father of his service in the French Foreign Legion and the British Army during World War I. Elbert was injured during the war, flying shrapnel and deadly gas leaving him with deep facial scars and damaged lungs. After the war, Elbert was posted to Rotterdam where he settled and met George's mother, Catherine. She was Dutch, upper middle class and a remonstrant Protestant. Elbert was granted a British passport for his service to the Crown in the Great War. This meant that George was born a British citizen. Fiercely proud of his acquired British citizenship, Elbert named his son after King George V. George had two younger sisters, Adele and Elizabeth. For most of their early years, the family lived comfortably among bourgeois conservative circles in the Netherlands. Idolizing the Dutch royal family, George became a Calvinist and had ambitions to become a pastor in the Dutch Reformed Church. The Baha family saw their fortunes dashed when Elbert's business, a glove-making factory, was affected like so many others by the 1929 Wall Street crash. George was only 13 when in 1936 his father passed away after finally succumbing to his wartime injuries. George was shocked to learn of his Jewish heritage upon his father's death, a fact which Albert had kept secret. This loss, combined with the ongoing economic hardships of the 1930s, resulted in young George being relocated to live with his wealthy aunt and uncle in their mansion in Zamalek, one of Cairo's most affluent neighbourhoods. In this new cosmopolitan environment, young George continued his education at an English and then a French school in Cairo, as a result of which he became fluent in both languages. It was also in Cairo, while living with his Francophile extended family, that George, facing a crisis as to his national identity, began to assemble the beginnings of his ideological worldview. He grew close to one of his cousins, Henry Curiel, an extroverted womanizer and a fervent Marxist. As a left-wing political activist, Curiel went on to spearhead the communist democratic movement for national liberation in Egypt. Henry was repeatedly arrested and imprisoned as a result of his political activities, and would eventually be assassinated by right-wing extremists in Paris. Their interactions had a profound impact, with George admitting in 1991 that Curiel's influence played a pivotal role in shaping his political and ideological beliefs. Despite this, George returned to Holland still influenced by his mother's strong Protestant faith and his ambition to enter the church. When the Second World War broke out, George was back in the Netherlands on a summer visit. He endured Nazi Germany's Blitzkrieg in May 1940 and the absolute decimation of Rotterdam. He managed to flee the destroyed old city to The Hague, where his mother and sisters were living. Upon arrival, he was greeted by an empty home, finding that his family had already fled to England, following the lead of the Dutch royal family. Despite himself being a British citizen, 
George refused to leave the country that he considered home. As the German war machine marched across Western Europe, George chose to join the Dutch resistance as a courier. He was motivated by a multitude of factors to join the fight against the Nazis. Not least of these were his Jewish heritage and the brutal destruction and occupation of his Dutch homeland. In 1940, the 17-year-old George Blake was interned by the Nazis with many other British and French citizens living in the Netherlands. He was lucky to be released after only a month, the Germans believing that their war would soon be won. For nearly two years after that, Blake worked for a local resistance group, dodging German patrols to deliver an underground newspaper which had as its chief aim to mobilize the local people to the Allied cause and to give hope that Adolf Hitler would soon be defeated. After turning 18, George felt that he had more to offer the war effort than being a paperboy. He was at the time living with a family in the southern Dutch village of Zundert. Together with the two daughters of the household, he planned to make his escape and ultimately rejoin his family in England. The first leg of his journey involved crossing the Dutch border into Belgium, which was going to be a challenge given the Nazi occupation of both countries. Making their way surreptitiously towards the border one Sunday morning, the group thought the game was over before it even began after they were confronted by a soldier a mere 100 yards from where they intended to cross. Relief flooded over Blake when he realized that his two female traveling companions knew the soldier approaching them, an Austro-German who attended their local Catholic church. Breathing a heavy sigh of relief, George was waved through the border and into Belgium. He continued his harrowing journey through occupied France and into Spain, where his journey would be brought to a sudden halt. In Spain, he was interned for three months in jail until Spanish dictator Franco saw the writing on the wall for Germany and chose to reinstate Spanish neutrality in the war in early 1943. Upon his release, George was determined to continue his journey, pressing on to Gibraltar. He finally reached London in January 1943. Upon arrival, he was briefly detained for a security investigation at the Royal Victoria Patriotic School in Wandsworth. After passing the necessary checks, George was finally reunited with his mother and sisters. In a bid to start anew, they anglicized their surname by changing it from Behar to Blake. Intent on continuing the fight against the Nazis, Blake joined the Royal Navy. Shortly after completing his training, he learned of a branch of the Navy called the Special Service, which he promptly signed up for. Much to his disappointment, this did not have anything to do with intelligence work or espionage. Rather, it involved the operation of two-man mini-submarines designed to enter enemy harbors to place explosives on docked ships. Blake's disappointment was short-lived, for he was found unfit for the role due to his propensity to pass out when underwater in the submarine. However, his fluency in Dutch and German and his time serving in the resistance caught the attention of the SIS, the Secret Intelligence Service. Soon after, in 1944, an SIS headhunter recruited George Blake, giving him his first taste of covert activity with the British Secret Service. Blake was assigned to P8, the Dutch section. There he supported resistance movements in Europe, including helping to train agents sent to the Netherlands and working to decode and translate the material they sent back. He quickly developed a solid reputation among his peers and was soon identified for promotion by his superiors. In September of 1945, MI6 dispatched Blake to Hamburg for his first experience in field operations. In the aftermath of the war, Blake found himself working for the Naval Intelligence Unit. His duties mostly included interrogating former German U-boat commanders to investigate suspicions that the local men were establishing an underground Nazi resistance movement. Blake was also tasked with spying on Soviet forces, and he quickly realized that former German officers, many of whom were in dire financial straits, were willing to use their extensive contacts in East Germany to work on building a local intelligence network. The mission was a resounding success, 
with Blake playing a pivotal role in establishing a network of agents right in the heart of East Germany. This success, combined with Blake's talent for languages, resulted in him being sent by MI6 to Cambridge University after his return to Britain. In the face of the ever-growing threat of communism from the Soviet Union, George Blake was tasked with deepening his understanding of the Russian language. Cambridge was not just an academic hub. It was a fertile ground for recruiting both MI6 agents and, as history would later reveal, double agents for the KGB. It was here that George was lectured by an English professor whose mother was Russian. She didn't preach communism, but had a deep-rooted love for Russian culture and the Orthodox Church. Under her tutelage, George found himself increasingly drawn to Russian culture, art, and history. This growing fascination was more than just academic curiosity. It was the first sign of a shift in George's ideological compass. While not yet a communist, the seeds were sown, and his next assignment would be the catalyst for a switching of allegiances. On the 6th of November 1948, George Blake was dispatched to the British legation in Seoul, South Korea. While his official title was that of Vice Consul, his true mission was far more covert. Blake was tasked with gathering intelligence on the communist activities in North Korea, China, and the Soviet Far East. Korea had become a battleground of ideologies after its division along the 38th parallel in 1948. The Soviet Union backed the North, while the United States supported an aggressively anti-communist regime in the South. While not yet officially at war, both sides engaged in bloody guerrilla warfare and intelligence and propaganda campaigns against one another. George Blake was sent into this perilous environment armed with little more than his wits and diplomatic cover. His mission to establish an agent network in North Korea proved largely futile, and over time, he grew increasingly disillusioned with what he considered to be America's puppet administration in Seoul, which he came to view as fascist. The geopolitical landscape then shifted dramatically on the 25th of June 1950, when the Korean War erupted. In a swift and dramatic move, the Korean People's Army from the north overran Seoul. As British forces rallied to the defense of the south under the banner of the United Nations Command, Blake, along with his fellow British diplomats, were taken prisoner by North Korean forces. As the momentum in the war shifted, the prisoners were moved further north, journeying through Pyongyang and eventually to the Yalu River. It was during this period that Blake witnessed the devastating bombings of North Korea. The destruction inflicted by carpet bombing by the US Air Force was of a scale surpassing anything Blake could ever have imagined. While imprisoned, Blake immersed himself in the writings of Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin, books that had been sent to the North Korean prison camp by a nearby office of the German Stasi. Blake's profound ideological transformation was starting to reach its zenith. He had become convinced that the triumph of communism would herald a more peaceful era for humanity, juxtaposed against the materialist and imperialist convictions of the USA. He finally embraced communism, and in so doing, found his allegiance to the West wavering. Blake spent three years imprisoned in North Korea. Freezing cold and fed barely enough to fend off starvation, he would have been bombarded with communist propaganda from sunrise to sunset. The extent to which Blake became brainwashed over this period remains an open question of psychology. Whatever the answer to that question may be, in the autumn of 1951 and while still a prisoner of war, Blake took a decisive step. He handed his captors a note written in Russian addressed to the Soviet embassy. He indicated that he had important information to share. While Blake never revealed the full details of his recruitment into the KGB, what is known is that he started meeting with a young KGB officer named Nikolai Luenko, who was sent to the camp to recruit prospective Western spies from among the prisoners. To test his bona fides, Blake was told to write down everything he knew about the structure of his employer, the SIS. This he did without qualm, 
and when it was compared against the information British double agent Kim Philby had already provided, it was a dead match. With this, George Blake's recruitment as a double agent for the KGB was complete. Joseph Stalin died on the 5th of March 1953. With the appointment of Nikita Khrushchev as the Soviet Union's new premier, tensions between East and West began to ease somewhat. Arrangements were soon made for Blake and his fellow prisoners to be released in a prisoner exchange. Upon his triumphant return to England on the 22nd of April 1953, Blake was set to rise through the ranks of MI6. Yet all the while he played a dangerous double game. To the world, he was a loyal British intelligence officer and a heroic former prisoner of war. Yet in truth, he was the KGB's most promising agent in place within British intelligence. George Blake, codenamed Diomed, was about to embark on his path to infamy. In September of 1953, Blake resumed his work for SIS and was stationed at its offices at Two Carlton Gardens. There he met SIS Secretary Gillian Allen, whom he started dating. George was reluctant to marry, knowing that his decision to betray his country would eventually drag her down a dark, complicated path. Nevertheless, Gillian persisted with George, with the result that they were married in September of 1954. The couple went on to have three children together, all boys, named Anthony, James and Patrick. Within a month of his return to England, Blake met with KGB agent Sergei Kondrashev. He was a rising young intelligence officer dispatched by the KGB with the sole responsibility of running Moscow's mole inside MI6. Kondrashev was a recent addition to the KGB's Foreign Intelligence Directorate, which meant that his photograph was not yet an MI5's file of known Soviet spies, allowing him to fly completely under the radar. The initial meeting between the spy and his handler was a chance for the two to get acquainted and to discuss logistics, including Blake's need for a camera to photograph classified documents. Kondrashev promptly supplied the necessary equipment, and it wasn't long before Blake was funneling reams of top-secret MI6 material to the KGB. Blake would later become known as the Lunchtime Spy, taking the opportunity when his colleagues were out for lunch to photograph classified materials. He was meticulous in his methods, using a miniature Minox camera to capture about 200 exposures a month. He only photographed documents to which he had legitimate access in the course of his duties, thereby avoiding suspicion. Unlike many of his treacherous contemporaries, Blake wasn't driven to betray for personal gain. There was no trail of wealth or luxury in his wake. Instead, he was a man fueled by ideological conviction, a belief in communism, and perhaps a naive hope to bridge the vast divide between the East and the West. But in the world of espionage, secrets have a way of coming to light and Blake's misguided double life would eventually start to unravel. In April of 1955, George Blake received a new posting to Berlin, the very front line of the ideological battleground of the Cold War. Moving his family to Germany, he was based in the SIS offices attached to Hitler's Olympic Stadium. Ironically, he was tasked chiefly with identifying and recruiting Soviet double agents. By the time that Blake had arrived in Berlin, he had already made his most significant betrayal. Operation Gold was a joint British and American surveillance program. This top secret initiative saw the Allies constructing what became known as the Berlin Tunnel to tap into Soviet communication lines in East Germany. This joint venture between the CIA and MI6 aimed to intercept the Soviets' shift from radio to landline telephone communications. The Soviets had relocated their most secure communications underground in Berlin, and the Allies sought to tap into these lines as a means of gaining an early insight into Soviet intentions in Europe. The tunnel's construction was a significant engineering challenge, not least because of its length, 1,476 feet, slightly longer than the height of the Empire State Building. The operation was ambitious and costly, 
with a final bill exceeding six and a half million US dollars. How George Blake managed to compromise the operation was really quite simple. He happened to be the secretary at the meetings held at number two Carlton Gardens in London when the operation was initially planned some months prior. He made an extra copy of the minutes and a sketch of the tunnel, which he promptly handed over to Kondrashev. The West's grand spying operation was thus compromised from the very beginning. The KGB, however, faced a dilemma. Ending Operation Gold too early would have risked compromising one of their most valuable double agents. Knowledge of the operation was restricted to only a few select KGB leaders who for the time being chose to do nothing. Evidently, George Blake's value as an agent in place was worth more to the KGB than the harm they anticipated suffering as a result of Western spying. The KGB bided their time until April 1956 when the tunnel was discovered in a staged event for the press. Rainy weather had washed away a portion of the road, revealing the secret cables beneath it. This was the perfect opportunity for the Soviets to blow the lid on Operation Gold. The revelation to the world of Western espionage proved of huge propaganda value to the Soviets, who described what the US and British had done as a breach of the norms of international law and a gangster act. Notwithstanding the Berlin Tunnel having been shut down after just 11 months, processing centres in London and Washington continued transcribing the hundreds of thousands of intercepted communications until September of 1958. Despite being so close to the debacle in Berlin, Blake managed to avoid suspicion following the Soviets' fortuitous discovery. For the next four years, Blake continued to systematically leak every significant secret that came his way. His success as a double agent in Berlin was so significant that KGB files later smuggled out of Russia recorded that Blake had effectively neutralized Western intelligence in East Germany. As quickly as MI6 could recruit agents, they were compromised by Blake, rounded up by the KGB, and either imprisoned or executed. But all good spy games must eventually come to an end, and as is so often the case, Blake's run of good luck would eventually be brought to an end by a betrayal from within. In the early months of 1958, the American envoy in Bern, Switzerland, was handed a perplexing letter. Within its folds was another sealed note, specifically addressed to the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. Penned in German, the letter bore the signature Heckenschutzer, in English meaning sniper. Instead of being delivered to its intended recipient Hoover, the message found its way to the CIA. As weeks turned into months, the anonymous informant began revealing Soviet secrets to US officials. The prevailing theory was that the covert informant was a high-ranking official in the Polish intelligence community, potentially with ties to the KGB. Unsolicited informants were always treated with a good measure of skepticism, given the potential for such a person to be a Soviet plant. However, it quickly became apparent that Sniper's intelligence was authentic. The identity of Agent Sniper was later revealed to be Michael Golonevsky, who, at the time of his first contact with the US, was the deputy head of Polish military counterintelligence. Among his startling disclosures was the very real possibility that there was a mole operating within MI6. Agent Sniper had provided the CIA with a list of seven Soviet spies working in the US, Britain and Israel, and a list of 26 Polish officials targeted for possible recruitment as agents. It was deduced by the CIA that these lists must have been obtained by the KGB from a mole in Britain's secret service. MI6 dismissed this possibility out of hand. They believed that the KGB got their hands on the documents after the burglary of a safe in one of its offices in Brussels some months prior. The denial notwithstanding, MI6 began an investigation into the 10 men who had had access to the documents, which included George Blake. No evidence of any espionage or skullduggery was discovered, and all 10 men were quickly exonerated. As much as they were loath to admit it, MI6 knew that they very likely had a mole, but they just had no idea who it was. 
By the time that Blake left his post in Berlin and returned to London in May 1959, he was most likely under suspicion. Nevertheless, he continued to funnel critical intelligence to his KGB handler for the next year. In September of 1960, MI6 discreetly removed Blake from active duty, sending him to the Middle East Center in Beirut under the guise of learning Arabic and where he would not have access to any classified materials. Although Agent Sniper never explicitly named the mole in MI6, the trail of breadcrumbs eventually led investigators to George Blake's door. Golanovsky defected to America along with his mistress in January of 1961. His testimony, along with the information contained in the letters he had already sent, was the linchpin that convinced the British that George Blake was a double agent. Had British intelligence scratched a little deeper during their initial investigation, they could possibly have stemmed the flow of information to the Soviets much sooner and saved the lives of some of their compromised agents. Nevertheless, British intelligence had to look forwards, and began meticulously gathering evidence for what would be a crucial interrogation of their prime suspect. The evidence against him was purely circumstantial, and thus the investigators needed to do all they could to extract a confession. As the net tightened around Blake, and with Golonovsky safely tucked away in a CIA safe house following his defection, Blake was recalled to London on the 3rd of April 1961. Although he was told that the purpose of his trip to London was to have a routine interview relating to his next assignment, Blake was worried. Before leaving Beirut, he met one last time with his Soviet handler on a deserted beach. He was told not to worry, that London didn't suspect a thing. Putting his trust in the KGB's intelligence, he departed for England, leaving behind his pregnant wife and two sons. As soon as he arrived at the SIS personnel department in St. James's Park, George Blake knew that the game was up. He was met by a stern panel composed of both MI6 and CIA officers, who over the next 48 hours subjected him to an intense interrogation. He was bombarded with evidence of his spying activities and questioned relentlessly. Despite the mounting evidence, Blake steadfastly denied it all, remaining cool under pressure. It seemed that against the odds, he had gained the upper hand in the interrogation. However, the interrogator's persistence started to wear Blake down as the interview dragged into the wee hours of the next morning. He finally broke when CIA officers suggested to Blake that he had been tortured while a prisoner in North Korea and forced into becoming a spy. Blake immediately denied this. His knee-jerk response was to say that it had been entirely his own decision to work with the Soviets. With the utterance of these words, Blake had sealed his fate. Realizing that with a slip of his tongue his cover was then well and truly blown, Blake's resistance crumbled. He began to cooperate with the CIA and MI6 investigators, revealing the depths and details of his betrayal with startling candor. The confirmation of MI6's worst fears sent shockwaves through the organization and in the Western intelligence community at large. The idea that they could be betrayed by one of their own, no less a man who had endured years of captivity for his country, was almost inconceivable. Blake revealed that he had disclosed to his KGB handler the entire breakdown of MI6's personnel, the location of all its safe houses, its order of battle, and its outstations across the globe. A later assessment of the damage caused by Blake to Western intelligence was seen as being much worse than Philby. According to Blake's own admissions, he had compromised nearly 400 Western agents operating covertly behind the Iron Curtain. While he had already caused untold damage to Great Britain, the game was finally over, and it was time for George Blake to face a jury of his peers. In May of 1961, George Blake stood trial at the Old Bailey for his espionage crimes. Under the Official Secrets Act, the maximum sentence for a single offence was 14 years. However, Blake's actions were split into five distinct periods, leading to five separate charges. On the 3rd of May 1961, Blake stood in the dock, entering guilty pleas for each of the charges. 
Much of the trial was conducted in closed session, ostensibly to protect British intelligence secrets, but more likely to shield the government from further embarrassment. The Lord Chief Justice, Lord Parker of Waddington, handed down the maximum possible sentence, 14 years for each of the three counts of spying consecutively, and 14 years for the remaining two counts concurrently. This totaled a 42-year sentence and was the longest non-life prison term ever issued by a British court. Blake expressed his astonishment at receiving such a harsh sentence, given that he had cooperated fully with the authorities and had entered guilty pleas. The harsh sentence was not enough to quell the questions lingering in the air about the integrity of the British intelligence community. In the wake of the trial, Prime Minister Harold Macmillan, who had already been embarrassed by other failings of what he referred to as the so-called Secret Service, attempted to downplay the severity of Blake's betrayals to Parliament. Macmillan asserted that while Blake had indeed harmed the nation's interests, the damage was not irreparable. However, the reality was far grimmer. While Blake maintained that none of the agents he compromised faced any physical harm, MI6's assessments painted a very different picture. It was estimated that at least 40 of the approximate 400 operatives compromised by Blake met an untimely end at the hands of the KGB. The CIA recognized the Blake case for what it was, a profound and detrimental breach of Allied intelligence efforts against the Soviets. Blake had revealed every intricate detail of Western espionage methods and intelligence structures as he could lay his hands on. The discovery of his betrayal forced a complete overhaul of British intelligence protocols. The trial's aftermath continued to reverberate in the months and years that followed. Macmillan's attempts to downplay the damage were met with public skepticism, and the subsequent exposure of other spies and scandals further eroded public trust. Locked away in Wormwood Scrubs prison, Blake might have faded into obscurity as being just another traitor who got what he deserved. After his wife Gillian learned of her husband's betrayal, she continued in the marriage, visiting him while he was in prison. However, during a visit in 1966, Gillian broke the news to George that she had met another man and wanted to file for divorce. With no light at the end of the tunnel, George Blake had nothing left to lose, but he was not yet done making headlines. Wormwood Scrubs, a Victorian-era prison with its imposing brick walls and watchtowers, was designed to be inescapable, but for George Blake, it became the setting for one of the most notorious prison breaks in British history. In 1961, Blake entered this fortress, a place where even the name inspired sympathy for its inmates. Inside, Blake was not a solitary figure. He made connections, notably with Sean Burke, an Irish anti-establishment figure, and two other inmates, Pat Pottle and Michael Randall. Sean Burke was serving a sentence of seven years for sending a bomb in a biscuit tin to a policeman. While the bomb detonated, the policeman survived. Pottle and Randall were anti-nuclear campaigners serving short stints for non-violent offences committed in the course of their political activism. The men soon got to talking, and before long, they began to hatch the beginnings of a plan to spring Blake from the prison after the others had been released. By the end of 1965, all three of Blake's accomplices were out of prison and working to plan the escape. Burke smuggled in a two-way radio which was used to communicate with Blake and coordinate the escape. Pottle and Randall assisted in the plans by raising funds to purchase a getaway vehicle and rented a London flat to serve as a safe house after the escape. After much planning, the date for the escape was set for the evening of 22 October 1966. After serving five of his 42-year sentence, George Blake was going to make a break for his freedom. The plan was really quite simple. Blake would slip away while the other inmates and guards were engrossed in the showing of a movie, and would scale the prison wall with the assistance of Burke, who was to throw over a rope ladder. It was raining heavily on the night in question. Blake, Shielding himself with blankets draped over a stairwell railing, managed to squeeze through a small gap between the iron bars of a broken window. 
He then carefully navigated the slippery roof tiles and made his way to the edge. With agility, he grabbed the gutter and descended to the ground, pressing himself against the prison building. In the dim light of the prison yard's arc lamps, and after what felt like an eternity, he finally saw the ladder being thrown over the wall. It looked incredibly thin and fragile, but the moment I saw it, I knew nothing then would stop me, Blake later recalled. Blake managed to scale the wall, but fractured his wrist and was knocked momentarily unconscious after jumping from the ladder as he lowered himself to the ground. Burke bundled Blake into the getaway car, and the duo then sped away into the night. Their getaway was not without its hitches. In their haste to flee the scene, Burke collided with another vehicle that had stopped for pedestrians. Despite the onlookers' startled stares, they managed to continue on, reaching their hideout within a few minutes. When Blake's absence from Wormwood Scrubs was finally noticed, it triggered one of the largest manhunts in British history. Officers scoured airports and embassies. False rumours circulated that Blake was going to be smuggled out of the country by hiding in a harp case belonging to the Czechoslovakian State Orchestra. As Blake's image was broadcasted nationwide, he and Burke, from their secret location, raised a toast to their freedom, relishing in the pandemonium they had caused. In the weeks that followed, reports of Blake being sighted came from all corners of the globe. Following a tip-off, Australian authorities surrounded a plane that landed in Sydney, inspecting passengers for any sign of disguise, but Blake was not found. While all this was going on, Blake remained hidden in London. Blake and Burke were considering their options to smuggle him to Russia, from dyeing his skin brown as a form of disguise to simply making a dash for the Soviet embassy in London to seek asylum. After much deliberation, Blake and Burke decided on smuggling him out in a secret compartment of a camper van. On the night of 17 December 1966, and with George Blake stowed away in the hidden compartment, Michael Randall, his wife Anne, and their children set out, aiming to cross borders under the pretense of travelling for a holiday in continental Europe. While en route to Dover to catch the ferry across the English Channel, Michael and Anne were alarmed by the sounds of banging noises coming from within Blake's hideaway. He had a hot water bottle with him, but in the confined space the pungent smell of warm rubber was causing him to retch from nausea. After discarding the bottle, they only just made it to the ferry before its midnight departure. The vehicle was waved aboard without inspection. After making the crossing, Randall and his wife drove continuously through Belgium and into West Germany, not stopping until they reached a border crossing into East Germany. Near Berlin, Blake was left in a wooded area near an East German checkpoint. An army officer, surprised by Blake's claim to be an Englishman, contacted the KGB. Blake's former handler soon arrived on the scene and whisked him away for an initial debriefing. George Blake's gamble for his freedom had paid off. He had managed to evade the scores of British police searching for him and was soon aboard a plane destined for Moscow. Having served only five years of his sentence, Blake was once again a free man. The British government was left red-faced, the escape adding insult to what was already a serious injury. Not only had one of the most notorious traitors escaped from a maximum security prison, but he had also managed to flee to the very heart of the Soviet Union. George Blake's arrival in the Soviet Union was anticlimactic. He was given no hero's welcome. Indeed, it was three years before his defection was made public. Blake also soon realised that the life behind the Iron Curtain he had been sold was a lie. He reportedly told a friend that after a week in Moscow, he knew that communism was the biggest disappointment of his life. Although he enjoyed material luxuries that most in the Soviet Union could only dream of, including an apartment in central Moscow, a Volga motor vehicle and a dacha outside of town, he found his surroundings not much different to his prison environment back in England. It was a bit ramshackle, a bit old, a bit decrepit, and the paint had come off, he said. As with all British defectors, he was never fully trusted by the KGB, and his life in the world of intelligence was largely over. 
he managed only to find a boring job translating Dutch texts for a Soviet publisher. His small social circle comprised other spies such as Kim Philby and Gordon Lonsdale, as well as his mother who split her time between Britain, the Netherlands and Moscow. Blake found the separation from his three children, Anthony, James and Patrick, unbearable. He was distraught when he heard the news that his wife had obtained a divorce in his absence and had remarried. Notwithstanding his newfound loneliness and personal circumstances, Blake's relationship with communism as an ideology remained largely unchanged. This was despite the later revelations of the true horrors of Stalinist communism. In interviews during the 1990s, he spoke of communism as a great experiment of mankind, a vision of a just society. Amidst the personal turmoil, Blake found love again. In 1968, while on a cruise along the River Volga, he met Ida, who worked as a French translator. The pair started dating, were married, and later welcomed a son, whom they named Misha. Blake's work for the Soviet Union was eventually recognized, with Blake being granted the Order of Lenin and being made a colonel in the KGB. In 1990, he penned his autobiography, No Other Choice, detailing his journey and the choices he made. The book reflects his somewhat deterministic view of how his life played out, perhaps a remnant of his Calvinist beliefs. Time did eventually bring reconciliation with his children from his first marriage. As the years passed, honours continued to come his way. In 2007, on his 85th birthday, Russian President Vladimir Putin awarded him the Order of Friendship. By 2012, Blake, then 90, lived in Moscow on a KGB pension in a rent-free apartment. Age had taken its toll on his eyesight, and he was nearly blind. When in 2017 the 95-year-old Blake was interviewed on Russian state TV, he said that he had not lost faith in socialism, saying, If I didn't believe in it, I'd be dead already. He continued, saying that not for a moment had he regretted his life and he looked on to the future with optimism. He saw himself not as a British traitor, but as a committed Marxist-Leninist. His assertion was that to betray, you first have to belong, and that he never belonged. This encapsulated his lifelong belief. While he was both a British and a Dutch citizen, and was fond of both peoples and cultures, he was at heart loyal only to his ideology. Addressing a press conference for Western journalists in Moscow in 1992, George Blake said, Those people who were betrayed were not innocent people. They were no better nor worse than I am. It's all part of the intelligence world. If the man who turned me in came to my house today, I'd invite him to sit down and have a cup of tea. Unfortunately, many of the men Blake betrayed were unable to invite him for a tea party given that they were dead. As for Sean Burke, he joined Blake in Moscow where he lived for 18 months. However, a life in Russia didn't suit the man from Limerick, and so he returned to Ireland. Despite the British government's requests, the Irish government refused to extradite Burke, citing his part in Blake's escape as falling within the political offence exception to Ireland's extradition laws. Doing his best to drink himself to death, Sean Burke died in 1982 of a heart attack. Pat Pottle and Michael Randall were eventually prosecuted in 1991 for their role in aiding Blake in his prison escape. They too stood trial at the Old Bailey, raising as their defence that their actions were morally justified. Their motivation for helping Blake was the inhuman prison sentence imposed on him and the poor treatment he had received from the British judicial system. Although the judge in the case directed the jury to convict, this was ignored, and the two men were unanimously acquitted. The end of the final chapter in the life of George Blake came on the 26th of December 2020. At the age of 98, the former MI6 officer and Soviet spy passed away in Moscow. The Russian Foreign Intelligence Service hailed Blake as a brilliant professional of special courage and determination. Vladimir Putin expressed his deep condolences, 
stating that Blake had made a valuable contribution to ensuring strategic parity during the Cold War and maintaining peace on the planet. In contrast, in the West, the British government's response was muted. Blake's death reignited the debate about his legacy. To some, he was a traitor who had caused immeasurable harm to his country and the free world. To others, he was a man of conviction who had received an unjust prison sentence. George Blake was buried in a Moscow cemetery, in the city that had been his home for more than half a century. His coffin draped in a Russian flag, the ceremony included full military honours. As the cold winter wind swept across the cemetery, there was a sense of an era of Cold War espionage coming to an end. We can only speculate whether George Blake finally and truly felt a sense of belonging living out the rest of his life in exile in Moscow. If he did, one wonders if he ever stopped to consider whether it was worth the cost.